Tell us a little bit about this story, and then I'll have you read a little bit from the beginning so we can all get up to speed with it. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's called uh, Entwined in Love. Actually, it's uh, based on uh, the shared roots between India and Cambodia. Uh, actually, um, uh, what happens, the story is, uh, in the beginning, uh, the, a couple, I mean, a couple is actually running away from uh, an attack, actually. There's an attack happening and a couple is running away and the woman has given birth to a, I mean, to twin, uh, tw twins uh, very recently. And what happens is they take refuge inside a temple and uh, a thief actually steals away one of the babies. And uh, he runs away and, uh, and the couple tries to find the baby, lost baby, but they are not able to do that. So basically, that's the premise of the story. I've sent you the prologue oh, of the yeah, story. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Yeah, I remember. Okay, so let's have... Uh, I will... Let's yeah, have you read... Share your screen. Oh, my, I got to share screen. Okay, I'm yeah. going to share screen. Thank you. Thank you. Share. Let's hope nothing weird happens to the rest of the Zoom. Okay, so um, I have this, do you see this orange mark? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Let's. So can I start from this one, from this paragraph? Yeah, just read, yeah, that, that paragraph okay. would be great. Thank you. Okay. Sika had been sleeping peacefully in her ward when she suddenly heard the noise of defending roads, of striking and brutal murders of clashing of metals. Terrified, she turned towards Kosal. Her bulging eyeballs conveyed how frightened she was. Kosal tried to calm her fears, stating that they could manage the situation smoothly. Kosal held their son onto his arms while Sika lifted off their daughter from the cradle. With pin drop silence, they crept away through the balcony window. As they reached the ground, Kosal was stabbed on his shoulders. Both Kosal and Sika screamed. Holding the baby with a single hand, Kosal managed to remove his shirt with the other. He tore a piece of cloth from his shirt and bandaged his wound, thereby stopping the blood flow. Kosal then took few deep breaths, calming down his anxious heart. The two, along with their infants, then managed to escape from the severe brutality of the army. They had been on a run ever since then. The couple had been witnessing several deaths all around them. They wanted to flee from Cambodia as soon as possible. Okay. Should I continue? Then, uh, no, I, no that, that was great. Thank you very much. And the couple had barely eaten a few crumbs of bread during the past two weeks. The army of the Khmer Rouge had been on a wild goose chase ever since that day. Uh, Kosal had been stabbed. So, um, <clears throat> so my, my comments, there we kind of have two. Um, I think one, let's see, which one to start with? Uh, let me start with um, sort of the issues of uh, believability. So this is, these are, I don't know if this is meant to depict a historical event that actually takes place, but there, are, well, maybe you could tell me, is it, is this an event that actually takes place? Is oh, it yes. A, yes, it, uh, it's an event which actually took place. Is it is it a story that was like in a newspaper or? You no, know, actually, I, I mean, I know even. The, I know the Khmer Rouge is a real thing. So the issue is, I know the Khmer Rouge is a real thing. I know that the um, revolution, you know, or whatever the, with Pol Pot is a real thing. Um, I had, I, I had Cambodian friends who experienced um, this, uh, you know you know, horrific um, violence of this period. Okay. So, so I, I know a lot of, I, I don't know a lot about the reality. I obviously haven't experienced it, but I know that it, it was a, was a reality. Um, yeah. Is the, the issue 
because there is this real context, I don't know if your characters are actual real people that like, for example, you might know that experienced this or, you know, this would be 1970, right? Is it 75 yes. or between 72 and 76 or something like that? Yeah. Um, yes. But because you're writing something that's that that's historically factual, there yeah. are aspects of the way the the violence and and the way these characters behave in the violence that don't completely make sense to me, you know. Okay. So it becomes a, what you what you want to do as a writer if you're writing about something that should be perceived as being real, you need to do the kind of uh, careful work to make sure that the the reader doesn't doubt that it's real and instead okay. think that it's just something you're making up okay right? so so that means that there there are aspects of physical reality that have to take place you know when someone oh. is stabbed then they're injured <laughs> you know like when yeah. you know like if someone has to you know get out of um so, someone tell me, so Cambodia, what city is this in? What city does it take uh, place in? Um, actually, it takes place near Siam Reap. Okay, so, well, near, so then that physical reality of that place has to be on the page. We have to know about it. We have to see some of the details of that place. We have to kind of understand okay. if this attack if the attack is taking place, okay. like, where does the couple go? Like, how do they, I mean, if I, honestly today, if there was a, a huge revolution in my city, right? And okay. my family was attacked, everything would be new. I wouldn't know what to do at all. I mean, I would go, okay. what would I do? Take my family and go hide in a culvert somewhere and then look okay. for, things to be calm and then try to seek someone that might help me. I don't know what I would do, but all of those okay. sort of situations of physical reality would have to play, play a role here so that we could understand. Oh. Like even, oh. so the couple had barely eaten a few clumps of bread during the past two weeks. So that's improbable, right? They have to eat over two weeks time. We actually have to eat a lot. We need calories in order to function. They okay. also need water. They need, okay. you know, they they need things of physical reality that will help us understand that this is a real place. I write, okay. I write about um, a lot of different things. Okay. Um, but I but I do write about warfare sometimes, and when okay. I do, I'm very careful. I'm I'm always careful about physical reality because okay. the moment we the moment we put one word on the page, you know, I'm sure Abhinav has, has done this. I can see him already. You know, he's watching a movie and then suddenly he says, okay. that's, that's not true. That would never happen. I mean, he could be talking, it could be a cartoon, you know, in okay. space, but he would be like, I'm sorry, gravity just doesn't work that way, he'd say, okay. right? And, and, and it's true that that makes you think that, well, I'm just reading something that someone made up as opposed to actually being in the reality, you know? Okay. And that's what, that's what happens to me when I read, they just had three clumps of bread. Well, that makes me be like, in two weeks, I'm like, well, they needed water. They needed to be able to okay. go to the bathroom somehow, right? They needed, to, they needed food. They needed to be able to hide someplace from the people who are looking for them. How do all those things happen? Okay. Um, so, I, Abhinav, maybe I can get you to, to actually chime in. You, you have a comment about, I know in your own writing, you know, since you you write some detective works and things like that, you know, how do you, how do you deal with these issues of reality? Because you're making up the story, obviously, but you also have real things involved. So, uh, gosh, uh, <laughs> uh, I, there are two or three things that, that go in my mind when I'm writing about this. The first one is that uh, if I am skimming over details, it has to be a conscious decision, number one. 
and I should have a good reason for skimming over the details because the fact is that it is the details that make the show don't tell seem credible. So if I'm saying a person, you know, uh, uh, went from the south of Delhi to another part in New Delhi, and if I say that he got there in 20 minutes, which is not possible at any time of the day, unless and until he has a, a very fast car at 3 a.m. in the morning, I want to mention that. But if the action is taking place at 5 p.m. in the evening at rush hour, and if I say he got there in 20 minutes, then people are, are going to say, hey, no, this is not real. I don't, I, I don't think the person knows what he's talking, writing about, or he has never been to Delhi, and he's just making things up. So that to me is the crux that is, and I've said this, uh, I've shared this in other uh, fora, uh, for, fora also, that uh, I try and read out aloud the things that I've written, and that helps me from, you know, it, that helps me in many ways. And one of them is uh, if something doesn't seem right when I'm uh, reading it aloud, then I know that, the, that there's a problem with it. That, so, you know, this one, for example, they had had three clumps of bread. Now, that, that's a good detail to have, but it's an incomplete detail in my mind because the moment you've brought in the, car, the, the point about food, then the next question is that food and, and water is also equally important. And if yes. water is important, then water is somewhat scarce to come by in, in a forest, un unless and until you know. I mean, if you look at the Mahabharat, that is one of, uh, there are at least two inc uh, incidents uh, that uh, that uh, take place in or around water and a couple of uh, sub-tales also. But, you know, the Yaksha Prashna Samvad is uh, centered around the concept of finding water in a forest that uh, where it's uh, difficult to find. So hmm. my... Uh, right. My my two minute uh, segue into that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Avanath. Thank um, you so much. And uh, does Ram? Do you you have a comment about reality and and you know it's I'm gonna I will tell you I'm I think every writer will be so sympathetic. You know, like you know Avanov is going to have a scene in which someone has a uh, you know a. a, a a Smith and Wesson, you know, 357, and he's gonna, you know, kill, you know, eight bad guys. And then it's like, but someone like me is gonna say, well, you know, it's because I'm American, I know all these things, you know, that it doesn't have that many bullets, you know? So you can't do that. And then I would say, Abhinav doesn't know what he's talking about, you know? That's I, a, that's a, that's a, sorry to inter interrupt you, Otis, but that's such a useful, important point. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, it reminds me of this in instance in, when, in my book when I was writing about this person pulling a trigger. I actually went and Googled around till I found out, number one, how much of um, uh, how much of the trigger have to travel before you know the bullet is fired, number one, and how much of pressure needs to be applied for the trigger to be uh, moved. So it, it, it was probably a minor obsession of mine, but I think at the end of the day, if put forward correctly, well enough, I think it adds to the uh, to the realism of the book. Right. Well, I do this kind of thing all the time. I, I, I had, you know, a lot of praise. I wrote a story about snowmobile, snowmobiling, and I, there are different ways that we can figure out things, but, um, you know, I read about it. And then I went to a shop and I, you know, pretended I wanted to buy one. I got on it and I had them talk to me about it and I, you know, grabbed the things. Um, I love doing that kind of research. I had a, I had a soldier who had to carry quite a heavy weapon. So I got a pipe, I filled it with concrete and I carried it through the hills of California um, to feel what it would do to my body to carry it like that. Okay. I just made that story up. I didn't actually do it. I thought of it. I didn't actually do it, but this is the way I think, you know, I want to know really what it's like. And one thing that does occur to me even here is that, you know, you have characters being attacked and I don't know if you've ever been attacked. Um, I have some experience with this kind of, um, you know, you know, very heightened aggression, let's say. And uh, I even have some experience with, 
with being stabbed actually. So I know what happens to the body when that happens, you know, and, and even, and the mind even more particularly. Okay. These are also things that we want to incorporate. We, we, okay. because of our, because of our, uh, our modern culture, we are actually so very casual about violence, particularly, and our depictions of violence, and they are, and they are generally completely and wholly inaccurate, particularly in regard to our responses to them. Um, you know, the idea that anyone is cool, you know, that anyone is cool when in, in these acts of, no, that, that is not the case, that, that no. Um, Ram, you were going to weigh in on reality. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so one thing I find is that uh, when uh, when a story is set in a contemporary location, I find that a lot of uh, in a lot of stories that I have read, uh, they don't get the details right. Uh, a lot of people they maybe read a travel log or a travel book and they feel that they can write about it. Uh, some people probably do it. Uh, like for example, I read one book where it is set in Mumbai, and Mumbai in Mumbai the lifeline of Mumbai is the local trains. And it had certain details about the local trains, which were absolutely incorrect. It had like the hero and the hero reaching out through the windows and like you know, almost touching each other's hands. That never happens on any railway track, ever. And in all Mumbai local trains, the windows are barred with iron grills. You cannot put even, you can probably put a finger <laughs> out, right? So you can't the do that. Yeah, that, that, so yeah. that was a major flaw. And, and it talked about a, a local train station, which doesn't exist. And it mentioned by name. And it doesn't exist, right. right? So, and like for example, there was one story. It was a short story competition, an extremely one of probably one of the uh, most prestigious short story competitions in the world. And a couple of years back, the prize-winning entry, it uh, it spoke about a girl in a tea shop on a highway, and the owner of the tea shop he puts Q-tips in to clean his ears. The only problem is in India we don't call it Q-tips, we call it earbuds. And the second thing is, oh, owner of a tea stall will never spend money on ear, but he will probably clean his ear, pick his ear with probably a key or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So this that is was a... an that detail was so so pathetically bad. And then there no. were there were photographs of I think some share or some of some Britney Spears or somebody in the newspapers and magazines. In Indian magazines, we don't have that. We have of Indian singers and Indian actor actors. So this was mm -hmm. a person who did not know how that place looks like and a story was written about that. So the moment I saw that it was so jarring that I couldn't even relate to the story. Maybe the story was very good because I'm sure the judges saw some merit in that to get, to award it out of 4,000 entries. Maybe there was merit in that, but the detail was so bad, I couldn't get beyond that. <laughs> let me let me, let me me interject and, and let, let, let me steer this towards, so it can seem very hard to do. You have yeah. you have yeah. this you have this city in Cambodia in 1975, so that's not yeah. even modern. You can't even look at modern pictures necessarily to get the accurate information. But this is this is what I do. I love because I use stories to explore. For me, I use stories mm -hmm. to explore things that I haven't experienced. And so, like, there's this story that I wrote that took place in Mali. It takes place in Mali because I wanted to go to Mali. But I can't go to Mali. I'm stuck in the United States and I don't I can't afford it. And I'm maybe I'm too scared or whatever's wrong with me. Right. So I don't go to Mali, but instead I write a story. So I do research. I go and what I'm looking for, what I'm looking for in research is not always um, facts. I'm looking okay. for I'm looking for language. I'm looking okay. for the way things are called things. Right. I'm looking okay, for the okay. fact, you know, like in Mali, they have griots, you know, the storytellers. So I'm like, griots, okay. storytellers. Okay, I want a storyteller in my in my piece. I'm not writing okay. every detail about the place, but I'm taking something that's very particular to Mali and putting it there. They have this cave in these mountains that, you know, are filled with these bones of the ancestors. Okay, I want that in the story, okay. right? Okay. I'm speaking things that I think are amazing and I'm putting them into the story but in this story particularly and I'm looking at pictures but it but I also am in this case I'm writing about climbers who go to Mali and they're climbing on these spires called the the Manda Fatma so all of these things are exciting to me but I knew a lot about climbing 
I'd been rock climbing oh. for maybe 10 years before I wrote this story. So when it, came, oh. when it comes to the details and particularly the physical details of what it's like to climb, okay. I can write those. And so when the reader is reading, it's like, oh, there's Molly, there's the Manda Fatma, and there's you know, the griots, and there's this, that, and the other thing. But I have these scenes of the rock climbers, and I'm writing about something that I absolutely know about. I know how to work okay. the ropes. Okay. I know how to tie the ropes. I know how to do the clips. I know everything about rock climbing. And so I'm combining what I know with the things that I don't know. I think this goes to what Abhinav is saying too. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm understanding the details I'm not including. There's tons of them, right? Okay. But I'm creating this atmosphere that feels like reality. Okay. And it's actually being okay. based very much so on the point of view character and the reality okay. of physical reality of a person in the situation. Okay. So as, a, as a way to sort of think about it, because it can be daunting no. to say, oh, I have to learn everything. Like, you know, do you have... To, and some people do this, I think it's a mistake. You know, do I have to learn what kind of weapon? I mean, in, in the Khmer Rouge, they had children as soldiers, right? Um, the person I knew was a, I knew okay. someone who was a child during that period of time, right? So okay. he was inducted into Pol Pot's, um, you know, revolutionary army. It's just absolutely horrific. Okay what okay. uh, these children were were obligated to do, which was to execute okay. their parents, right? Oh, okay. so, um, but, but like, what kind of weapon did he carry? Do I need to know that? I, I don't know, maybe. I mean, I, I do, okay. lo I, love, I love going into the details, I truly do, but we make decisions because finally what we're trying to do is create an environment. We're not trying to okay. just be in the weeds of details. We're trying to create the, a verisimilitude of life and it has to make sense, but we don't want the reader to step out, right? Oh. That's always, oh. for, for, for us as writers, all of us as writers, and even if the world oh. is completely fantasy, it still has to make sense, you know? Okay. I was watching this ridiculous, you know, movie, Lightspeed from Disney with my kids. It was terrible. You know, oh. the, the, the characters are being chased by this rocket ship. They crash. And then there's one scene where the rocket ship, the, supposedly the rocket ship wants to kill them. And it comes and it just oh. flies away. It's like, that would never happen. Why, why would they do that? If they want to, they want to annihilate them, they've, they've accomplished what they want to. They made them crash. And now they just strafe them until they're gone. I mean, I, I don't want to be a jerk about it, but that's reality. Anyway. Okay. It didn't matter that it was taking place on another planet, is what I'm saying. Okay. Um, okay. And then the next big thing is, so in this story right now, just a lot of violence happening is not a story, unfortunately. So okay. there's a way to think about it. It doesn't, so for a story to work, it, you don't have to have a lot of, you know, explosions and, you know, gunplay and violence. It's not that you, you could have those things, or you might, okay. or you might have, you might have a dinner party where someone forgets to put the, the tea into the teapot and now everyone is drinking just warm water, but no one will say anything. That's not bad. I'm going to use that one. Okay. So everyone's there drinking warm water, but no one will tell anyone else that they're only drinking warm water. It's delicious. Thank you. You know, uh, sorry, I like that story. Okay. But a story, oh. a story is about a character deciding okay. to do something and then trying okay. to do it against the odds. Okay. That's what the story is about. And through that test, it becomes a test of character in which the okay. character then discovers their true self in a way. So okay. they just they they change, they transcend, they evolve, however we want to think about it, into something else okay. because of the action of story. And okay. it doesn't matter what the story is. And in fact, when we have a lot of violence and things like that, that can sometimes be, you know, that's, that's the easy way, right? That's, the, oh. That, oh. that's Hollywood. That's Hollywood of the last 30 or 40 years. That's like every Bruce Willis movie. 
every action adventure movie. It's just it's just men overcoming physical force by being more forceful. That story told a lot. So okay. you can have it, but really, really, you want to think about the character who is involved. The way I, the way I think of it is that every character has their plot. Okay. Every plot has their character. They go together. This okay. character, this character basically needs, I would emphasize needs this plot. They need okay. this plot in order to be transformed and to transcend into the place that they needed to go. Okay. Basically a kind of fulfillment of destiny, right? This yeah. character okay. getting any other plot, nothing happens. Okay. They need this plot. And so that's okay. that's how I think about it. So it may be one of the things you need to do in this piece, it seems to me, is you need to decide, okay. and this is a this is a question for all of us, whose story is it? The okay. person you can write that whose story is it? The person whose story it is is also the person who's changed by the story. Okay. They become the point of view character. Okay. Okay. So, like right now, as I, as I read here, we have um, Sika and we have um, Kosal. We have them both, yeah. but they're sort of interchangeable and they're equal. I'm not in okay. anyone's point of view. I don't see this world okay. through somebody. When okay. I wrote my piece, when I wrote my piece about Molly, okay. um, I was trying to do something experimental, but I had a point of view character who the entire world okay. was seeing. So I okay. know what it is to perceive. Like they, my character saw the griot, saw the huts, okay. saw the man, the okay. atma, saw the, yeah. um, the carabiners. You know. And okay. touch them and climbed on the rope. So okay. you need to figure out who is the central character for the story that sees the story yeah. and experiences okay. the plot. And okay. then they arrive at this. Um, okay. Okay. It is this is this is a challenging, this is a challenging piece, but I will say okay. absolutely that the world of the, the, the Khmer Rouge revolution under Paul Pot is absolutely yes. an amazing place to, to situate a story. And I would love to read okay. a story about that period with characters in it. Okay. Okay. Um, it's, okay. Uh, and, and I can feel in here that you have, okay. there's so much okay. energy in, the, in okay. the writing right now. So just use okay. that energy and, um, make some of these decisions about character, kind of control it a little bit, control your energy okay. a little bit. And um, okay. and I really look forward to seeing more of this work. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, the main uh, character, I mean, the main protagonist of the story is the baby, actually. The baby, uh, actually, the couple gives, I mean, the woman gives birth to twins, actually. She gives birth to one girl and one boy. And the girl gets lost when uh, she's hardly a couple of weeks old. And uh, the son, I mean the boy, he grows up and he finds his um, twin sister. Actually with the help of a woman uh, with whom he's in love. He's actually in love with a woman named Sandhya. And with the help of Sandhya, he actually finds his uh, long lost twin sister. So that is how the story goes. This is basically the problem. and coastal okay sorry about Shali. i think you uh you broke up i think i understand so well then then we probably have to have a, another conversation about something else so if you're saying that the main character is the baby oh uh, yes that, yes well so how long do you want this work to be what 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 are you looking for in terms of pages for the for the uh, actually it's, it's actually basically a short story uh, okay. It will be between five thousand to ten thousand words. Okay, so I would say. So th there's a thing in writing where we think about scope, 
Scope okay. is like, how big a thing are we trying to write about? One okay. way to think about scope is how many people are you writing about? <laughs> Another okay. way to think about scope is what is the time frame that you're writing about, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. you know, are we, we're talking about a baby. We're talking about two babies. We're talking about the parents of them. We're talking about them yes. growing up. So we're talking about yes. 17 years in a yes. short story. Yes. The, the thing that we want to do in any story is we want to create basically one effect. Okay. A story okay. is a very unified thing and it creates just one effect from the story. And that is okay. a sense of surprise, awe, and catharsis in the reader that's created okay. by just two things, a character okay. and a plot okay. that okay. leads to a transcendence of the character. Okay. Okay. That is, frankly, already a lot to do in a short story. Okay. Okay. It can sound to me that you're that you're what you want to write about has a scope that's too large for a short story. Yeah. Okay. In my opinion, writers okay. are are famous for um, basically saying "screw you, Otis." To me personally, I can do whatever okay. I want, and let me show you me doing it. And now, okay. don't you feel stupid? And I, <laughs> okay, that's not, not really what happens. They don't do it to me, but I just okay. take it personally. So, but writers want to take on challenges. They often even give themselves challenges. Can I write the story of an entire life in four pages? Let me try. And they, they try and most people I will say fail, but there might be one person okay. in, a, in a thousand who succeeds at that task, right? Um, let me write a story instead of about one character. Let me make it we instead. There's a okay. story by Stephen, Stephen Milhauser called The Knife Thrower written in we. Okay. That is extremely successful. It's an amazing story. And it's an amazing story because it's finally about that unusual choice about writing about we. Because it okay. basically then has to show a we moving through the story, confronted by an event, and coming out changed. Okay. The form of the story remains the same, but he's taking okay. on a difficulty. If you choose to... So for me, you know, even writing about the story about a baby would be a big challenge. Okay. Because what do okay. you have in terms of the baby's ability to proactively engage with the world? Because a, a story is about okay. a protagonist engaging okay. with antagonistic forces. So how can the baby okay. do that? The baby, okay. if, if the baby is just a victim, is basically having antagonistic forces just beating on the baby. Okay. Uh, Otis, it's, I'm Czech. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I would I would think a little bit about it. You know. Okay. The the thing the thing for for us as writers, all of us, is that okay. I I do not think you are ever going to. You will always write your story. <laughs> you okay. will write it. I believe in you. I believe in you. Okay. The only thing I'm doing is trying to give you advice that might make it a little bit quicker to arrive okay. at that end product. The world, okay. for us as writers, for us as writers, the world is an antagonistic force filled with audience. The okay. audience is our incredible antagonist. The, our, okay. our antagonist seems to hate us, Rom. Okay. They hate us. They do not want to give okay. us a chance. They're looking for us to make any mistake possible so that it can discard us into the mists of history. Is that not right? Okay. Yes, it's right. We will, in continuously trying to confront this audience, we will transcend if we live long enough. Okay. I am only trying to give you some advice that might make it happen quicker, but it's still, okay. it's still a process. You know, it's still... It all has to take place. There are no shortcuts. There are no okay. shortcuts. 
Um, no one knows that better than me. No shortcuts. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so think about some of these ideas. Think about okay. if they if they make sense to you conceptually, then try to apply okay. them and experiment with them. But if they don't, okay. also don't do it okay. and go your own way. We all have to develop okay. in our own ways. Um, okay. But, uh, I love the energy of this work, as I said, and I love this. Okay, uh, thank I, you. I love this world. And okay. My, I, I mean, I it made me it made me really think of my my friend. I I was teaching okay. in high school. He was a student oh. in high school. He had oh. bullet wounds when he escaped from the Khmer Rouge. He was a soldier okay. in the Khmer Rouge as a child, and he escaped. Okay. Oh, okay. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Let's, uh, Sweta, uh, let's Thank you so much, you. Otis. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Sweta, um, tell, tell us a little bit about what's going on here. I think this is a bit of a rewrite of your story. Yeah, uh, actually, the thing is that I'm sorry, my throat is very bad. But uh, the thing is that I'm looking for the right voice for the Cambodian story. So yeah. um, the the previous, the first submission, of course, I had given it for the Cambodian story. The second submission was something. But both of those submissions that I had uh, presented in these skills was something that was a part of the unconscious writing. So I would just write automatically. I do a little bit of editing, that's it. But this is not unconscious writing. This is conscious writing. So um, this is this this is not something that I just wrote without knowing what happened and the just sentence word came after word. That kind of this is this is conscious writing. So I just want to know if this voice is working. And uh, if if it is, I will use this voice for the Cambodian story, and I will write consciously. Yeah. Um... Well, I really like even what you're saying about your process and how you're working. So that's great. I, I, I love the fact that you're saying you're basically looking for the right voice. This is probably our biggest struggle, right? Because the voice, the thing that we're presenting our work with is all of it, right? All of it is in the voice. Mm -hmm. Then we choose what we're summarizing. We choose what we delve into in scene and all of that. And so if that is the question, I think you have a pretty clear answer here. Let me have you read some of this. Um, okay. Let's, uh, I don't know if you can, see, just basically to there. Sorry, I, that didn't move correctly. Uh, I meant it to go, just read to that. Okay. That, that opening. From the beginning? <laughs> just please. Our, our grandmother, Peria Party, managed all the finances in the house. Peria Party, when she was not working, rearranging furniture, done, dusting the window sills with the pallu of a sari, or scrubbing the floor, would sit cross legged near the kitchen and do tiny calculations in her thick yellow ledger. When Peria oh, wait, 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 Party wait, 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 can I stop you just there? What a wonderful sentence. Okay, I just, I love it. I love it. A Petra Pati, when she was not working, rearranging furniture, dusting the windowsills with the palu of her sari, or scrubbing the floor, would sit cross-legged. The use of cross-legged there is just wonderful. Would sit cross-legged near the kitchen door and do tiny calculations in her thick yellow ledger. Beautiful sentence. Sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. When Peri Party had to allocate money for an unexpected expense, she would do it with an I.O., shaking her head. Peri Party lived simply, her things occupying little space in the house. She owed only two cotton saris and one rubber bathroom chapel that she used when she went out. In a tiny lacquer jewelry box immersed in sacred ash were a pair of large floral diamond earrings that she wore till the one that had split her, uh, till the left one had split her ear lobe. In the miniature dressing room, which hung on the straw wall of her bedroom, Peri Party kept a palm sized plastic comb that she used to smoothen her gray white curls before she knotted them into an untidy bun. Her only large possession was a single sewing machine that she kept covered in old bedspreads. 
Betty Party bought rough cotton material wholesale and stitched them into frocks for me and by Dehi. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, so I think I think that this opening is wonderful. So, but there there are this piece as a whole basically moves. It's kind of like an origin story, right? I think it's really because it gets to the point where. Um, Petya Pati is sets up basically these girls' experience with the rakshas, it seems like, which they then access through dreams. So you're you're covering this uh back kind of backstory or character story as like mm -hmm. she's sort of the originator of a, giving them this power to then mm -hmm. see the rakshas um and have that experience. So that's interesting. You know, it wouldn't be, it's not common, right? Usually, usually when you start a story, and because they're short stories, we don't have time to dilly dally, you know, and do some of this work. We jump right in. You know, the beginning of this is definitely in voice, it's definitely summary from another character talking about. Uh, uh, right? So we have this other person talking about her. I'm already aware of that. That's a narrator who exists because I can tell that she has a bias. It's not an omniscient narrator. So I can feel that um, there's someone else involved in this story that I'm not meeting. Mm -hmm. It's summary. Normally, we would try and start a story, uh, as they say, in media race. So that's the most typical way, meaning in the middle of the action. We establish the conflict so we know who the protagonist is and who the antagonist is, and we understand the conflict, which is the external struggle. And we then, because we've established that right away, we wonder what's going to happen, basically who's going to win, right? And next we establish the internal struggle, which basically tells us why we care about the protagonist struggle. And that is because the protagonist struggle is like our struggle. The external struggle is particular. You know, it can be, you know, the protagonist versus the Khmer Rouge. It could be, um, you know, uh, Bonnie and Clyde versus the banking system. It can be whatever you want, it's particular the internal struggle is a universal issue, one of trust, one of, um, you know, seeking love, seeking acceptance, you know, um, all of these things, universal issues that every human being on earth knows. We usually start with those two things. So, and you're not, right? But you're doing a lot, <laughs> you know, so... It, we we need to make our own choices, and I'm just pointing out that you're not making that choice, which might grab the reader and pull them in. But that's not to say that I'm not pulled in by this. But you don't want to do a bait and switch. You know, bait and switch, the saying, you know, like, uh, you know, I say you're going to get this story about Piriyapati, <coughs> right? But then I change it into this other story. So you've gotten me involved in this woman. I mean, I'm fascinated by her. You know, she sits, she sits cross-legged with her ledger. I want to know so much more about her. And then you switch it to another story. But I'm not saying that that can't work. You can use bait and switch, but then you have to bait. And then when you switch, it has to be very clear. And we have to be as involved in the new story as the one you presented in the beginning. And then most likely, and you know how this works, uh, Pichapati will return at the end, right? She'll come back to maybe even save the day or give that sage advice that's going to allow the story to complete. So when you make choices, it, it has ramifications, as you know, like we, we as writers, we're like, we're going into a rabbit hole and we don't always know how it's going to work out. We, it's, um, 
you know, I think of it as uh, like a uh, like a lucid dream. You know, when you dream and you can also influence how it kind of moves, mm -hmm. but you can't totally control it. And it always has to make sense, right? It makes sense in the dream world. That's the way a story is. Um, so you'll make your choices. I think in terms of this piece, if this is going to be an origin piece for the story that I'm anticipating you writing about the, the narrator and that, and that girl's relationship with the Rakshas, I think at the end of this piece, you'll have to be a little bit more careful about the transition, which you kind of rush now. You do a lot to establish the character of uh, the auntie, or sorry, uh, grandmother. You do a lot to establish the, the character of the grandmother, but then when it comes to you know the, the little things that allow the girls to see the Rakshas, you go quick, right? And now you've lost me. I, I mean, I totally believe you about the grandmother. I need to know a little bit more about how she has a kind of mystical ability, maybe, that she's so unusual that she's developed these capacities or that, you know, she comes from a long line of witches or whatever it is, you know, I need to know maybe a little bit more about that. And then I also need to know the process. It's like a, like a superhero story, right? I think we talked about this. Superman is a superhero, but we understand he came from Krypton. We understand that he actually has this weakness, which is kryptonite, which returns him to the state of power that he had on Krypton. You know, it, it's nuts, but it makes sense, right? And you have to, you have to cover those little moves as carefully so that they, they, they make a kind of logical sense. Like there's a, you mentioned the, the diva, the divi who controls the dreams or remembering the dreams. Nidra Devi. Yeah. So like if the grandmother is somehow able to help the girls experience this Devi, right? Or you just have to follow the logic that helps us accept this world that you're writing. Um, but um, I, I honestly, the thing that you are gaining here with your voice is what Aristotle calls ethos. The care and attention you give to the grandmother in the beginning here makes me accept you as the author. I join with you because I feel like I'm in good hands. I feel like uh, this is a person who sees the world with detail and accuracy. And so when you get to that part where you start skipping quickly, I lose that person a little bit. I lose that kind of considered thoughtfulness. But, but here, I'm totally with you. I am absolutely engaged with this first sentence. It's actually the second sentence that I already read would sit cross-legged near the kitchen door and do tiny calculations in your thick yellow ledger. I am so with you with that in that moment and with this woman. I want it to be like a, a Chekhov story, you know, Anton Chekhov, who's just going to, you know, probe the consciousness and the world of this grandmother who maybe is not considered very much in the family. It seems like she isn't but actually has this incredibly rich world. You know, I, I love all of that. But um, the other thing that happens a little bit here in this beginning is, mm -hmm. I, and the way you're explaining, you're, you're working on the voice. That totally makes sense to me. The, the paragraph, there, the story isn't starting for sure. You're doing other things. You're working with the language and that's all really great. And the language you put on the page is fabulous. It doesn't have any form. So like normally we would try and construct a paragraph to do something, right? Mm -hmm. And then we'd have another paragraph that did something else, right? So now we're moving along in these, in these kind of chunks. But you're just writing, you can see like you're writing this very long thing. Okay, da, da, da. there's no paragraphing. So there's no dynamics, right? 
the paragraphs create a sense of dynamics because we have one thing, then we have another thing. We have this and that. They create a dynamic with each other. But when we just have one long paragraph, it's just a, you know, it's just a string of words, you know, like that. So it doesn't have anything that's sort of formalizing it. It's not, you're not creating a structure. But that also makes sense as you're telling me you're developing the voice. I think you're doing great work. I very much like the voice of this narrator. I can spend a lot of time with her, you know? So really, really great. I, I, I like your process. Thank you. Oh, oh, look at this. Look at this, you know? It's like, <laughs> One of the things to be aware of, as I was saying to Vashali, like right now you have the two girls. When they come onto the scene, I don't realize that they're really the characters. We're, you know, and, and really the, the narrator is the character. You have them described as we. We is a very difficult point of view to work with. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will tell you again that the only successful story I've ever read with the point of view of we was The Knife Thrower by Stephen Milhauser. I suggest you read that story. You will love it. But it ends up being about we, right? Whatever, whoever the protagonist is, that's who the story is about. It's hard to have a we be transformed by the same events. It also doesn't really make sense since we all have individual experiences, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you, you probably need to uh, drop down into the point of view of the I character. And then you'll have two voices basically in the piece since you're writing in first person, the narrator voice, and then the I actions, you know, the character actions. And they should be kind of distinct. If that makes sense. That's a little, maybe that's for later. But anyway, think about the point of view, think about whose story it is, take it on. If the protagonist is the first person, then, then you want to really experience the world through their point of view. A great example of first person narration that illustrates some of this is The Great Gatsby, if you've read it. The Great Gatsby is actually, I know it's taught everywhere. It actually is a really good book, okay? It's mistaught everywhere pretty much, but it really is amazing because the central character of Nick seems to be telling the story about Gatsby, right? Nick is basically a narrator who tells the story about someone else, the great Gatsby. But mm -hmm. the great Gatsby is actually the antagonist who makes Nick grow. It's actually Nick's story, even though he does not seem to be telling his story. It's, it's extremely illustrative in terms of establishing point of view. Anyway, um, make some make some decisions about this, but I, I love your character on the page here of uh, Pilya Patti, and uh, I I hope I hope she doesn't end up on the cutting room floor, as they say. That's a movie <laughs> term. <laughs> yeah, because the thing is, she doesn't have anything to do with the Cambodia story, but the, here I was looking for the right voice. So that, that, that's a good point uh, because in the treat, Cambodia treat. story she doesn't have any role right now. Well, well then then use her as an origin point. You know it's fine. Okay. You can always decide to cut her later on if you don't have the space. But I would maybe try to make her a little bit briefer. But you need to cover this transition with the with the rakshas and the dreams and then the understanding. You know being able to basically see and know the rakshas. That is actually yes. the crucial element. Yes. That's like the, yes, yes. That's like the, it's like the physics, right? I mean, this Superman is actually somehow about physics, isn't it? You know, even though it's completely made up, it's about physics. This is the physics of your story is going from uh, Piryapati, you know, through the, um, through the dreams and to the Rakshas. You actually had them see the Rakshas before the dreams. So work that out carefully. 
that's the core. But this presentation of this character at, at the start is nice. And then you have to figure out how she really transitions these two girls so that they can make this further transition into this other world. But she's a fabulous character. I say keep her. Do not, please, do not get rid of <laughs> Yafati. Um, she's fabulous. Um, I only have one other piece uh, from uh, Vandana, and she sent me a piece also last week that she just read the notes and then she continued to work, and I don't think she's here, so I think these are the two pieces of the week. Um, but really great pieces. I, I really, I appreciate both of them uh, very much. I mean, I love the worlds that both of these pieces are drawing me into, absolutely. Otis out. <laughs> so we have uh, uh, we have one piece pending, and uh, I think we have uh, which one is that? Sri Charan, you see, you're asking Otis to cover. Is there someone else here that I don't see? Uh, Sand grouse. Uh, uh, whose piece is it? Is Sri Charan here? Is Sri Charan here? I don't see him. I don't see him, so fascinating. I don't see him as a list of uh, in, in the list of attendees, but just got a chat message from him, so now I'm wondering where is Sri Charan? He he says he can't see the audio and video options, but he's definitely there in the chat. Okay, no, he joined us some time back and I've not made him a panelist, which I have now. So he should uh, be showing up any minute now. Yeah, I can see the audio and video options. Now. Okay, oh. I did not see you, Sri Tron. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this, this I had last week. Let's see what I said. Let's see. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's hear a little bit of it. Let's hear. Um... Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, let's hear the first page. Okay, sure. Uh, the father shivered at the first light of dawn. The great silver crows had already gone hiding behind the horizon, as the great red hawk woke up to seize the day. The monster would have been beautiful if not for the blood of the stars it had spilled across the sky. Uh, it was said that one day the red hawk would die and Lord Groves would rule for eternity. The father wished that today was that day. The chicks were sound asleep. The mother was asleep as well, tucking the chicks under her feet, denying them the freedom to wander off. A cold of it was. Vant would only scotch them in the midst of the red tunes of Kalahari. The father waited on the highest tune for the others to join him. The sand was warm already, a brief moment of comfort between biting cold and burning heat. From the top, he could see the hidden burrows of his neighbors and beyond. A depression in the sand here and there, a thin line imitating a snake somewhere. A passerby would not be able to notice the pattern, but a sand grouse could always tell where a fellow's nest was. There were not many passers by during that day. During the day, you might have to be either a lunatic or a sand grouse to build your home in the dead midst of a hellish desert a hundred miles away from any source of water. No one was insane enough to hunt in such an area. That included hawks. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, with this, uh, with this piece, so as I was reading in the beginning, I was a bit confused, hmm. I will admit. I didn't know um, what was... So when I just get the father shivered, I'm basically going, you know, and this is the way we are with all of, you know, language, right? Language is a symbol that triggers our associations. Mm -hmm. So when you write father, I think of what I think of as father, right? Mm -hmm. If you're changing that, you have to understand that in a way, and you probably have to help me. Mm -hmm. It could be that I catch up. You know, and I and in this case, I do catch up. I finally catch up with the chicks, you know, at that point. But it does it does mean that I've read a paragraph and completely misunderstood. 
It's probably not a trick that you want to play on your reader. Sometimes, um, well, normally you want to get your reader up to speed so that they, mm -hmm. the way I think of it is <clears throat> your reader is not reading to find out what is happening. They read to find out what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. Which is basically a way to say that we should assume that they do know what is happening. Like they're not trying to figure it out as they're reading it. They want you, we want to build our anticipation. So I would find a little way to do that. We have the issue that we've talked about in some other works about establishing that point of view. So I think we need to hear it all the time, right? When I boxed, my coach always said, keep your chin down. That's because our instinct is to get big when we feel threatened, right? I think it's the same thing with us as, uh, as writers, that we're basically afraid of having a confrontation, which is what a story is. And so we try to avoid it. But our protagonist is the person who's going to confront the plot. And so we have to establish who that protagonist is. And we want it to be established in the reader's mind. So that the reader knows who they're identifying with. They need to identify with them in two ways. So this is like, keep your chin down. Way one is you need to establish the external conflict. That's particular. Uh, this could be the father versus the hawks, right? Yeah. That could be the conflict. But I want to get them, I want to, I usually, I would suggest that we get them onto the page as soon as possible. And we want to have that internal struggle, which is universal, that allows me to identify with the protagonist. And here, it does not matter whether the protagonist is a sand grouse, whether it's a grandmother, whether it's you know a daughter, whether it's a baby. But it has to be able to have, I mean, the trouble with the baby is it's not maybe not old enough to have an internal struggle, and it's also not old enough to have an external struggle. But we need to be able to identify and say, that's like me. And when I say that's like me, then the protagonist basically becomes an avatar for my experience. Normally what we do. Um, but and so here, even just so the father, the father, the, the father ruffled his wings. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and turned his head and picked a mite off his back. He, but so however I write it, I'm doing something here physically that's allowing me to understand that I'm not dealing with a human being, but I'm dealing with an animal. And then I can learn more as I go along, but at least I'm picturing something accurately in my mind. But this is, this is actually important, this second sentence here, and this is for all of us. All of us, please take this away. We're trying to establish point of view. We establish point of view and setting. We do that by situating the reader within a point of view character. And then we need that character to see and experience the world around them, which are actions. Sensory experiences are actions that are occurring. They might be passive actions. So the character engages in, in proactive actions and passive actions of experience of the world, right? Both. So for me, I would continue to establish that point of view. So mm -hmm. the father mm -hmm. ruffled his feathers and looked at the mother and the chicks. Then he looked up to the sky, right? Then he looked up to the sky. The great silver grouse had already gone into hiding. I love this stuff that you're writing, Sri Tran. It's wonderful. I love this thing that, that you're making up. Now that I understand it's from the grouse's point of view, I love it mm. even more because it's the grouse's cosmology that you're writing. It's fabulous. I love it. But I don't know that when I'm reading it. Yeah. <laughs> so so you want to you want to continue. So let me know that it's a grouse. He looks up. The great silver grouse had already gone into hiding in the horizon as the great red. And I wouldn't say as, I, I avoid as because I don't like usually, I sometimes do it, but not too much. I like sequences of events. The great red hawk 
uh, was waking to seize the day. The monster would have been beautiful, the father thought, if it were not for the blood of the stars that spilled across the sky. What a beautiful sentence, Sri Charam. You are, you are very good in boxing. We have another thing that we say. We say, you know, you practice, you practice, but sometimes you just have to let your hands go. Mm -hmm. You are very good at letting your hands go. <laughs> now you have to practice. <laughs> yeah. You have to do the other side of it. But that's a beautiful sentence. I love it. I love the vision of it. Um, uh, he'd heard it was said. You see, see how I'm mm -hmm. staying focused in his point of view? But that also means that he's the central character that's meeting the plot, which you also have to design, you know, and get on the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, heard it said that it was uh, that one day the Red Hawk would die and Lord Grouse would rule for eternity. The father wished that day was today, but it didn't look like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or whatever. So, so now I'm so firmly involved with the. Now we're really ready to start the story. But failing to make those decisions means that we're also not ready to start the story, right? Which is, then we, we, have, we have a number of things happen, but they're, to me, they're a little bit formulas. It, it could be here or there. You're still world building in a way. Um, you're making decisions. You're placing them in the desert. But I don't really know what the plot is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fine in terms of development. One of, the, one of the biggest things we struggle with as writers is that when we're writing, we're developing our story, right? But the requirement, the requirement of, for the reader is that the story is already developed, right? So everything's in place. And you know, when I open up a book, I'm not, I'm not opening up a book to to read the the writer's development of the story. Mm -hmm. But when we write, that's what we're always doing until we finally have it finished and we give it over to someone to publish. So. You know, this is this is still sort of like seeking out the story, seeking out those fine lines. And I'm just, you know, just suggesting, you know, by saying it that you can maybe try and formulate exactly what you're thinking about. Think about the protagonist, establish that protagonist. Think about the antagonistic force. That's that conflict. Maybe the hawks that want to eat them before they migrate to wherever they're going. Perhaps. Um, you know, maybe it's a little, a story, a little bit like Icarus, if you know that story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is, it, is it Phaedrus or Daedalus? I forget who's the Daedalus. Of it. Daedalus. Daedalus? Yeah. yeah. So Daedalus, you know, saying fly with me and, you know, and you'll be safe. <laughs> you know, you don't want to go to the scorching sand and you don't want to go up to be picked off by the hawks, uh, whatever it is. Um, so that still has to happen, but I think is it's a very interesting uh, beginning. Uh, the issues of water, they, you know, you're you're experimenting with going into this point of view. So I'm encouraging you to do it even more. Right now, you're sometimes you're not really in a point of view, so you're actually you're doing something kind of half and half, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, but I want you to do something even more fully and then go to your strengths. I, 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 this, this introduction of the cosmology is, is wonderful. Um, the, the plight of a father trying to protect the children is always powerful. Yeah. So I, I really, I really enjoy what you're experimenting with. Yeah. Thank you. Otis. Thanks for inviting me. We gotta get we gotta get you to stop experimenting so much. I can tell you enjoy it, and get you to stick to do one thing over and over and over again. Come back to it the twenty times that it's necessary to finish it and have that experience. Mm -hmm. Send it out and publish it. This might be that piece. Yeah, uh, I'll change it a bit next week. Maybe I'll send this same piece, but yeah, uh, with the suggestions you had. I, I would love to see it again. It's a, a another really incredible world. I I really like the choice of the sand grouse. Um, it's 
my my kids recently read a book you know it was young adult your 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 work is more you know magic kind of a magic realism you know you you're on do yeah. you read yeah. um have you read uh gabriel garcia marquez no uh, no oh my god do you, you mean a uh, hundred years of solitude 100 years yeah 100 oh. years of solitude we gotta we gotta we got to school you up, Sri Tron. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I had that it, book, but I don't know if uh, that she is the other or of that. You, gotta, you, have to, you have to read that book at, at its right time. But if you get the right time, if you are at the right place to read that book and you have that book, it will be an unbelievable experience for you. Yeah, but, I had that PDF uh, in Kindle. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I started, but, uh, but for some reason I stopped it. Again, I have to continue. Yes, that happened to me too. And then there was another time that I picked it up and I did not put it down. I did okay. not do anything else. I did not eat. <laughs> I probably drank beer still. <laughs> I had an amazing experience. But anyway, you, you, you're, you're not really, you're not writing. I don't see you writing uh, young adults which does go into the animal points of view and things like that and can be very good. And in fact, those writers who go into um, animal points of view for young adult are very good at doing the point of view. You're doing the point of view, but you also have this sort of magic realism quality that, that sort of raises, raises the level, the audience level, I think. Um, but, you know, hopefully accessible for all audiences. I, I want everyone as an audience for my work. Um, well, thank you for that. Yeah, thanks, Otis. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Great. We did manage to cover three pieces. And let's hope we keep getting more pieces. Uh, folks, so we will put this video up on YouTube like we do every time. And uh, we will speak with you next Sunday. Thank you.